Interestingly enough, you would think I'm like really someone who's super in tune with their body. I'm the complete opposite. For most of my life, I was living in my head and I was living in my emotions. For me, when I was learning all this and training, I was like, Margaret me. I felt like I was someone who was literally in non-judgment, just figuring out the fascinating world of the body. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be with you here again on another brand new episode of the Autoimmune Hour. Oh, my goodness. Wow, things are changing rapidly around here. I don't know if they are in your neck of the woods as well. But goodness sakes, it's just (laughs) it's just a lot right now to take in after what the 14 15 months that we've been taking in all together and i've got a really great guest tonight first off i want to thank him publicly for reaching out to me and saying hey i'd be a great guest <laughs> and uh, he had listened to the barry shore i don't know if you guys remember barry shore from march but he just uh, that was one i couldn't quit laughing on barry's just a great great guy Our guest tonight mentioned to me that when he heard Barry say, when you're the best you, you make a difference in the world. And that, he said, our guest tonight said, made the hairs on his arm stand up. And so let me introduce Savio Clemente. He helps cancer survivors overcome the confusion and gain clarity needed to get busy living in mind, body, and spirit. He inspires health and wellness seekers to find meaning in their why and to cultivate resilience in the mindset. Oh, my goodness. We are going to talk tonight, too, because that is just, I think, cancer survivor, bravo, Savio. More than that, I think all of us are feeling the help in overcoming confusion and gaining clarity, regardless of our diagnosis, even if we don't have one. I know there are people that listen to our show that don't have autoimmune diagnosis or cancers or things like that. So tonight we're going to talk about feeding our three brains, the head, heart and gut. And so welcome, Savio. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much, Sharon. I really appreciate it. Oh, and it was great that you reached out to me. And I loved our conversation that we had just to get to know each other. Thank you so much. And you are such an inspiration to people. You are not your diagnosis. The the life isn't over till it's over kind of (laughs) idea here. So talk a little bit about your story. Just tell us what you overcame. Sure. So in 2014, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer. Uh, It started off with my stomach being sort of extended. And I did some blood tests with my naturopath. And I was living a very organic, healthy lifestyle. And he's like, something is definitely wrong. You need to look to see what that is. Fast forward a little bit. A couple of weeks later, I did a sonogram. They held me over for an hour. They told me, go to the hospital right away. And I was like, why is that? And I was admitted. And I was in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, I was told three days into the two weeks that I was diagnosed with stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I was bedridden for about a week. Uh, They put a nephrostomy tube in me and had to distend about seven liters of fluid. That's a lot of fluid. That is a lot of fluid. And basically the nurses were super, super kind. The doctors were super helpful. And I was told literally three days before you need to start your chemo round. I deliberated because a part of me was very holistic, organic, lifestyle minded. And the other part of me was, I'm very sick at this moment. And so I decided to do that first round of chemo, but I vowed that I was going to do other things on my own as well. Mm, I think that's where you and I bonded, because I firmly believe that the allopathic, the Western med that they put me on saved my life. 
But after that, I wasn't entirely sure that there was the wellness program was well rounded enough to get me well at the speed I wanted to get well at. <laughs> and so I've too found some things I can't imagine thinking you're just going to the doctor and then before you know it, you're in the hospital with a, a life threatening diagnosis. And it sounds like very little information was given to you through this process. How frightening. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I was told at the sonogram office that I need to have someone come and pick me up and I didn't understand why, and they weren't really clear. And then, uh, yeah, it, it, it blindsided me for sure. Um, but I'm also someone who sees life as not only a challenge, but sees life as something that you have to react to when stuff happens to you. I'm not someone who just sits, sits back and waits. Um, so I, took it sort of as a challenge as well. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand what's happening to me, but I know I need help. And to me, that was the big realization. Yeah. Wow. What would you recommend for people when this idea of, I, I find you very resilient in a little bit. We've got to know each other, very resilient. What are a couple of your top tips that come to mind when someone says, I don't know, Savio, <laughs> I don't know if I'm, I'm like you. I don't know if I'm strong enough. Inside you, did you go someplace or what is a tip you can give someone when they first need to find that inner resilience? I think for me, what was very helpful was, so I'm very sort of, you know, Buddhist minded, spirituality minded. I grew up Catholic, but I always knew there was a lot more to life than what I was at least taught as a young age. I think for me, what the big realization was, is that I am not only my body, that my body is only a part of who I am. I am a spiritual being, I have a soul, I have emotions. And I almost to some degree separated the two, even though my body was failing on me, the other parts weren't, I was still had metal acuity, I still had the desire to figure out what's happening, I still had the love and the fear, I think really is to kind of focus on what's happening to you right now, and what can you do about it? And I was always future focused minded, even when I got the diagnosis. My doctors were like, when they told me, they're like, you handle that so well compared to so many other people that we tell. And they were really surprised. And I don't know, that's just who I am. But I would say first focus on what it is you can control and what it is you can't. Yeah, absolutely. You did say uh, for a moment there, you talked about the future. And I wanted to clarify a little bit and maybe... Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I want uh, Savio. Though it was just like the short-term future. As I got to talk to you more, I understood that. Yeah, it's sort of like my what next. Not trying to shoot out there to the horizon uh, five months away or something like that. It was just like, okay, what can I control and what next? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're bedridden, right? I, I was like, well, I can get up tomorrow. I probably can't get out of bed, but I can definitely eat that well-balanced meal that they're giving me. Or, um, yeah, it's definitely not into the future because. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but definitely within, within what I can control within my grasp. Yeah. Okay. That, that was so important to me through my healing process too, because I found if I shot too far into the future, the anxiety began to build and you start playing all the what ifs and it becomes over it, for me, it became overwhelming. And I found just, okay, here I am. Here's the info that they just gave me. And as far as the future as I went was what next? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that seemed to I work. Remember, I remember my sister, you know, I, she was the first person I told um, because she came to the hospital and I said to her and she literally fell apart. And I remember trying to console her. It's kind of my nurturing sort of way of being. But I was like, it's going to be okay. I just have to take it one day at a time. And that's all I can do at the moment. Yeah. And she, you know, she found great comfort in that. Yeah. And I found great comfort in my taking it one minute at a time at the first. <laughs> you know? And, and also, you know, we, we talked about gratitude playing a big part in your recovery, as you tell it, that gratitude played a big part. And I have found that very common in a number of thrivers after diagnosis, not just autoimmune, but a number of people that I talked to. Talk, talk a little bit about your gratitude practice. Sure. So I do a daily digest of why those things happen to me. It's not really about what I'm gr grateful for, 
but why am I grateful for those things on a day-to-day basis? Now, in quarantine, it's a little less to be grateful for because <laughs> I'm doing a little less than, than what I used to. But I'm still thinking about, well, if I actualize that to happen, or if I'm grateful for that, whatever transpired in my life, then how can I make that sort of keep going like a, you know, ever so, you know, like a revolving door. And for me, the gratitude practice is thinking about it, figuring out what it is, and then figuring out why that occurred. And to me, it's been the strongest element to my day-to-day practice. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that idea of what can I do to make it keep reoccurring? <laughs> I don't know about you. One of my little secrets that I, it's not so secret because I talk about it on the show all the time is I'll start doing a practice and I'll get really great results. And then all of a sudden that little thing on my shoulder will whisper, well, you can cheat today, <laughs> whatever it is. Maybe I, maybe I don't meditate, maybe whatever it is or I sneak a cookie, who knows what it is. And then all of a sudden that can start the ball rolling in a different direction from what had been getting me such good success. So I love the idea that you're actually writing it down by two journals. So you can go back and say, okay, where where did I take a left turn? Absolutely. And then also for me, sometimes what happens is I get that inner critic that comes up and says, well, you can do that other thing, can't you? And I'm like, no, I want to do this. And so it's a battle. (laughs) Yes, I've told this story before. But when I first got my diagnosis, it took me several weeks to get in to see a a top doctor on my diagnosis. And I very well respected in, you know, the world here, in my little world here. And I remember he said, so what have you done so far? And honestly, not a lot, because I couldn't do a lot of my own. But it was, I was like, filtered water, eating only organic, cutting out, you know, all this other stuff. And he looked at me in all seriousness and he said, none of that is going to help. Be honest, the little creature on my shoulder whispered in my ear, see, I told you you could have had that chocolate sundae. And it sent me, after I left there, it sent me right to my favorite sweet store. (laughs) Unfortunately, (laughs) had some moments of (laughs) self-indulgence and then I had to work back into snapping back out of that and like, no, no, regardless of what that person said, that's not what's right for me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk. We're going to talk about in a long winded version here to get to this, guys, we're going to talk about the three brains. So Savio, tell us, what are the three brains? Three brains. Well, in embodiment circles, it's known as the head, heart and gut. And basically, it's to some degree, there's some studies behind it, that those three major organs in our body have a consciousness of some kind, and they dictate our choices, and they dictate sort of what's happening. And most people, even including myself, the default is the head, is to figure out, figure out the answer, to have, have, you know, have that particular, you know, aha moment. And with the head, heart, and, and gut, it's really about resourcing the heart first because the heart has that inner wisdom to feed the rest of the brains. And so for me, I always check in with self whenever I'm in a quandary of some kind. Now, not everyone is as skilled as you. So what when you say check in with yourself, what kind of practices or tips can you share with people if they're like going, hmm, sounds good. I've read about it before, but I have no clue how to do it. Sure. So I think the first key is to just be silent with self. I mean, if that includes playing some, you know, melodic music or even in complete, utter, you know, peace out, out nature and just trying to breathe into that organ, see it as an image of whatever your image of the heart is and breathe into it and see if you can, you know, talk to it or see if it has a voice, see if it has a shape, see if it has any wisdom for you, ask a question see if it's saying anything back to you. It sounds very rudimentary, but it's very powerful when you make it a day-to-day practice or, uh, or make it so that it is your default rather than something that you think of from time to time. Absolutely. Make it a practice and do it all non-judgmentally. If at first you don't hear anything, it just may be you're not tuned in to the quite, quite the way you need to be. So please uh, do this practice, which I wholeheartedly agree with Savio, uh, non-judgmentally guys, sometimes it takes a while to, to hear the, the, the wisdom that that is there. 
It is there. Yeah. It's just sometimes takes some practice to sort of like learning another language, guys, <laughs> you know, or learning to play the piano or something. It just takes a yeah. little practice. <laughs> and and most people are just not accustomed to checking in. So checking in with self is a concept that's gaining traction, but it's not something that most people are thinking what it is I need to do out in the real, like outside in the real world, rather than what I need to do with my inner world. And I think that's the disconnect. Mm. So I agree with you. Although in a bizarre way, because of all of the more alone time than normal for most people, although I know if you have large families, maybe being locked in the same house with them, there wasn't a lot of alone time. But I have heard that more and more people have taken that up as a practice to be able to. And uh, there was a story out today on the news about more and more people are rethinking, do I want to go back to that job? Or am I going to leave this job? And maybe this isn't what I want to do with the rest of my life. I was like, well, and they were talking about being sort of a bizarre thing. I was like, well, yeah, I think that's a good thing that people are finally checking in. Yeah, I, I think it's also important to sort of figure out for yourself, you know, people are always in sort of a, a battle between what it is that their spouse wants or what it is that their partner wants or what it is that their job wants. Or what, what is it that you want? What it is that, what is it that's going to make you thrive or happy? What is your vision? What is, what is your, what is your why? And I think the checking in part scares a lot of people, but also liberates them when they're able to, to do that. Mm, absolutely. It can be scary. It can be scary. So we're going to jump ahead over to the gut because that sometimes when it's scary, the gut gets a little tied up into quote unquote knots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the gut, it's a, it's a tricky thing because it really is something that if you think about it, needs to get fed a lot all the time. And the gut is really the seat of courage. It's really about us going out in the real world or going outside of our comfort zone and making things happen. And it's really a, even for me, a challenging thing at times, because, you know, I've had my challenges beyond cancer and those memories and those pains and, and those times of confusion. I didn't quite understand what was happening in my gut. It was almost like I knew that I was not feeling well, but why wasn't I feeling well? I never checked in with it because I didn't have the tools or I didn't have the knowledge base to do that. Um, and so the gut I find now when I check into it, not that it's talking to me, but it's almost like there's a feeling and a sensation that's happening between us. Like it's a balance, it's an interplay. And it's a tricky thing because we always think of it as something that needs to be fed rather than it feeding us the wisdom. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want you guys to ponder that. Uh, Savio has been sharing some really deep things with us in just our first few minutes together. We need to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, we're going to talk to him some more about how we do check in with ourselves and go a little deeper into understanding the head, heart, and gut, the three brains. We'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new. Hear different and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. Imagine. 
It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, from that quick commercial break. Oh, my gosh. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. You guys already know that if you've been listening so far. Anyway, tonight we're here with Savio Clemente, and he has overcome uh, cancer as well as many other things. He's a board-certified wellness coach, a stage three cancer survivor, podcaster, and founder of The Human Resolve. And that's what we're talking about today. A uh, couple of things is resilience, resolve, Regardless of what happens to us, things, as we know, we've learned, the world has learned firsthand, so many things are out of our control and can happen in a blink of an eye, as well as checking in with ourselves to make sure ourselves are okay, and all parts of ourselves, because in the Western medical world, too often, it's just the body that gets looked at, and everything else gets ignored. So, Savio, as we're talking about this, one of the things I wanted to ask more about when you said the gut it's more of a feeling I think for a lot of us it's all different when you say feeling are you meaning like an emotional feeling because for me when my gut's talking to me there's it's more a combination of a physical twinge and then an emotion so it's sort of like two two door doorbells knocking or ringing at the same time (laughs) yeah I I I feel like when it's knocking, like when I feel like when my gut is knocking, it's like actual pains. And when my gut is ringing the doorbell, it's like little vibrations. Um, So I think it's a combination of the two. I would say for me, it's definitely, and, and for my clients, it's definitely a feeling precipitated by some type of trigger of some kind. Yeah. And I just want people to know that because a lot of times people say, sure, I don't know what you're talking about. They have never taken the time or coached or trained into sitting in quiet and breathing and just listening, just listening to their body, listening to whatever thoughts come without judgment, all that types of things. What were some tips that you have that as you were learning, I found hardest for me was judging everything that came through. What are some tips that you have for people not to do that? Yeah. So interestingly enough, like you would think I'm like really someone who's been like super in tune with their body. I'm the complete opposite. Like for most of my life, I was living in my head and I was living in my emotions. Um, And so for me, when I was learning all this and training, I was like Margaret Mead. I felt like I was someone who was literally in non-judgment, just figuring out the fascinating world of the body. And so for me, the, the, the tips that I would give is like treat your body as a stranger sometimes, meaning don't think of it as something that keeps happening to you. For example, if you're someone who has digestive issues or, or let's say you have a, you know, emotional trauma that keeps, think of it when you're going into the body as you're trying to discover a new world. And every day, look at it as pieces of of content or pieces of information that puts together some type of tapestry of information, uh, as opposed to saying, well, this is what my body does. Think of it as like a new, a new stranger or a new friend that you're trying to get to know. And I think that by doing that, it allows transparency to happen. It allows you to really figure out, is it automaticity? Is it things that are an automatic for you or are things really making sense because it's showing you pieces of the puzzle. Oh, that's beautiful. I took a couple of notes there very quickly. So many directions I could go. First, I'm going to talk about this idea of automatic. How many times 
that as I was, as I go through the process daily, I think about what parts of my life, I mean, of course, breathing, digestion, those sorts of things are on autopilot. Thank heavens. <laughs> Thank heavens. Yeah. But even my breathing, I can interrupt the autopilot by breathing high and fast and causing me to go into, you know, some anxiety or some stress or some fight or flight. So just take some moments and thinking, what parts have I allowed to be on autopilot, which really probably not the best for my health and wellness if <laughs> I need to be a little more conscious about and take those parts of my life off autopilot. Yeah, I, I think the autopilot, I mean, like you said, it's a, it's a beautiful thing <laughs> because we wouldn't be alive. <laughs> um, but I think the autopilot does itself a disservice because we're so caught up in the next rather than the present. And for, for me, with my clients and my training, it's always been, well, what's present for you now? What's happening for you now? Not what you want to create all the time, but what's happening now? And trying to figure out, is there inner wisdom there? Is, is there a message? Is, is there something that's sort of juicy that's wanting to get out? And that's the hard part, but that's also the most beautiful part. I think that is the most beautiful part. And I like to think about making meaning. And oftentimes people, when they go to make meaning, they're looking way back. But I find even just making meaning of what just recently happened today or a few hours ago is helpful in making better decisions in the now. I'm like, okay, that was interesting. <laughs> you know, I didn't expect that result. <laughs> what decision, you know, led to that that set of dominoes going over that way. Now, finding that when I come from that place of curiosity, and we've had Sarah Payton on, who's the author of Your Resonant Self, and she talks about how we talk about ourselves. And one of my favorite phrases that she uses when she talks, when we talk to learn to talk to ourselves is starting things with I wonder. It's such a non-threatening way to talk about it. I wonder. I love that one. And so coming from that place of curiosity is so rewarding and relaxing to me when I can open up my mind and use what I say. So I always talk about this. I have this file folder in my head is if I don't understand something, instead of getting upset or angry or whatever, I put it in that isn't that interesting file. And because I may not know what the real meaning is right now. And so I put it like, wasn't that interesting? And I can go back and look through the file folder in my mind later going, oh, now I get why that happened. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> yeah, I'm a screenshotter. I like have thousands of screenshots of things I come across that I want to catalog in my head. So I totally understand where you're coming from. <laughs> I'm a screenshotter too, but it, it works. I love it. <laughs> I feel sorry for, you know, the person who has to, and when I pass on, uh, not, <laughs> not anytime soon, but when I pass yeah. on, they're like going to find all these little post-it notes <laughs> everywhere going, okay. <laughs> post-it yeah. note lovers, uh, it, it, you know, post-it note uh, inventors love me. So yeah. anyway, so now we talked about all three, the head, heart, and gut. Well, we've kind of skipped over the head. Let's talk about the head for a little bit. And then I want to learn about how we deal with maybe three sets of interesting results. How do we make sure, how do we come up with a combination <laughs> of a consensus? <laughs> totally. Well, the head, well, it's a beautiful thing, right? It makes us do, it makes us think, it makes us, you know, act, it makes us work. And it's literally, literally been my confidant <laughs> for most of my life. <laughs> um, and I think for me, the challenges and for some of my clients as well is why does it incessantly keep going? It doesn't really stop unless I will it to stop. For me, it constantly is feeding me and giving me and telling me and making me do. And by quieting the mind, as simple as, as, simple as that sounds, it's a very tricky thing. You have to focus so much on the stopping of the mind, so meditation or whatever practice that you have, to really listen to what's happening between the silence. Like, what is that missing link? And sometimes it's nothing, and sometimes it's an aha moment. So I think it really depends upon the person as well. Mm, yeah, quieting the mind is, as you say, it sounds simple, but simple isn't always easy. And 
as I be, learned to quiet my mind, we touched on this a little bit at the beginning, as I learned to quiet my mind, the main thing was not being judgmental about when the grocery list wandered through or, oh, my goodness, I just heard the bell of the dryer go off. I better get up and <laughs> change change out the laundry or something. Not judging any of those distractions, just coming back, saying it's OK and coming yeah. back. And, and also having compassion for the fact that maybe the laundry is not going to be done today. And maybe you fall short on the, the work goal that you had for this week. And that's fine because mm -hmm. life is kind of short. <laughs> it is. You know, the interesting thing about compassion, and I'd like to get your viewpoint on it. I find it interesting that it's so easy for many, many people to be very compassionate for others' shortcomings and flub ups and everything else in their world. But my goodness, they're flailing. What is that? Flagellating, I guess, or whatever that is. <laughs> they're beating themselves up where you would find that they would never be that way with someone else in their world. Yeah. And, I, and of course, that's a whole, there could be a whole bunch of reasons for that. Childhood rearing, genetics, what, you know, whatever the case may be, who knows. But I think to a large degree, it's also about not cutting yourself a break. It's sort of seeing another and saying, okay, well, I can understand. I can have empathy for that, but not having empathy for self. And that's where, the work begins. That's where you have to really do these deep dives and figure out why, why am I feeling that way towards myself? And what's the trigger? And how can I get myself out of it? And sometimes people say they'll hear themselves talk. And one of my favorite things is, is it your voice or is it someone else's voice? I have two voices that sometimes chime into the choir and I know very distinctly who they are from my childhood. <laughs> very totally. distinctly. Totally. <laughs> I mean, for me, like I sort of have that like inner critic or inner voice and I've sort of figured out a strategy and I call it my Ghostbuster <laughs> gremlin strategy. I basically literally the, in the movie, I'm like blasting that inner voice and I'm trapping it in a me you know, mechanical box so that it doesn't do damage. Um, yeah. And that's because there's for me, I find and for my clients that there's no way you can kill that imposter syndrome, you know, that imposter syndrome, inner critic, you can only keep it at bay. In my nonverbal work, the work that I do outside of the autoimmune or in, a, in my body language work, sometimes people come in and say, oh, you know, they'll say, I want to get rid of one a particular thing. And to me, it's just learning to tame it, as you said, turn it, learning to know when it's of value and when it's not of value. Because oftentimes it's there for a purpose. There are many, many things we learn in childhood that protected us in our childhood that no longer serve us. But extinguishing it to me isn't the right thing to do. It's all about, as you said, put it, I love the metaphor of the ghost buzz, putting it in a little plasma box or whatever that thing would be. <laughs> totally. Because in the movie, it would always somehow find a way to get out, which is fine, <laughs> as long as you accept that. But at least for now, you need to go to the corner, as, as I said. <laughs> yeah, go sit in the corner. <laughs> That's a nice metaphor, too. Go sit in the corner. I'm, I'm busy here being successful or something like totally. that. Totally. Like, I don't need that 15-year-old voice happening right now. I, I'm a 45-year-old man. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No. Or worse yet, I don't need to hear the voice of my fifth grade teacher <laughs> I know right now. Totally. Thank you very much. That's long totally. gone. Totally. Long gone. Oh, my gosh. So we're at, oh, my gosh, we need to take another quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Salvio some more about some of these great things that are all around wellness that really show us, take us to that next level of optimization that a lot of times, you know, the medical providers don't talk to us about. And I think that they were critical in my success. And I, Salvio, for your success too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I call them my saviors. I literally, after, I, so I was able to beat my cancer in, in um, you know, four months, um, thankfully. And I've been cancer free for about six years now. Yeah, they were definitely my saviors. But I knew that that wasn't the full picture of my recovery. My recovery rec had to include other things. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. 
Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at ProjectForgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with Savio Clemente, and he's a cancer survivor, and he's overcome the confusion and gained clarity needed to uh, get busy living, body, mind, and spirit. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. He inspires health and wellness seekers to find meaning in their why and to cultivate resilience in their mindset. And one of the things, Savio, I want to dive deeper into is this why. Oftentimes people have a hard time. They'll just go, I mean, it's almost as if it put up a wall or a a resistance to it, though. Some I've had coaches say, well, why? And I'll find I'll go back to that little five year old kid feeling like I've been scolded or something. So (laughs) how do we gently and uh, courageously step into finding our whys? I think when it comes to health challenges generally, there's always this unknowing. It's always sort of figuring out, not the why, but figuring out what precipitated. Am I a bad person? Did I do something wrong? Was it something that happened to me? And now it's something I'm, you know, residual effects of those, you know, decisions. I think I always tell my clients is the finding the meaning in the why is not really for you to figure out an answer per se, but it's really figuring out what are the, the elements that created those particular circumstances for you. And once you figure out that, you can sort of reverse engineer the why. In other words, the why is not about this is why and now this is happening. It's more about, well, what created that particular situation and how am I reacting to it? And that's the answer to the why. It's not directly because that's like to most people a lifelong journey but it's more about figuring out what are the seeds or what are the causes to that why. Mm. And I often find that people will find past traumas. We've had guests before describe them, and I'm not sure I'm really fond of this terminology, but I guess it's accepted. Big T traumas and little T traumas. I think how you respond to it is still a trauma, regardless of how you're going to uppercase or lowercase letters on it. But uh, a trauma is a trauma. Um, it's interesting to me as we go through and uncover some of those things that have happened in our lives. And sometimes it's interesting to me to people always point fingers at their immediate family. You know, it could be anything happening. It could be witnessing something on the street. It could be walking into a tree, (laughs) you know, and damaging your foot. It could be anything guys uncovering that those traumas and then accepting how you responded to it at the beginning and then knowing that now as an adult or a a more knowing self, even if it happened to you in your adulthood, you can choose to respond to it differently. And then the why morphs, right? The why becomes 
something even more deeper for you rather o than something. Oftentimes it becomes, uh, that's making meaning. Oftentimes then it almost becomes a gift. Like, wow, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I wouldn't have this deeper understanding. I wouldn't have this in my life if I hadn't had that event to be able to go through and then disassemble and understand Oh, well, that isn't that in there. I'm in my interesting, isn't that interesting file again? <laughs> yeah. Because I find making meaning is helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah. I And, and you know, I was watching something on, on Instagram a few months ago and they were speaking about COVID and they're speaking about like, all of us have been through a trauma. And the body is my work is really the body holds trauma. It just does, whether you want to admit it or not, at some point it does. And the key is really to find ways to accept it and then ways to overcome it or find ways to relieve some of that energy. Mm, right. I like to, and to make meaning of it. What can I do that will be useful and helpful now? Yeah. What's my next step that can be useful and helpful to myself and possibly others too. And oftentimes people say oh, useful and helpful. So I'm going to go write a book or invent a course or whatever like that. Instead of they skip that step of self-reflection. Yeah. And they also, to some degree, skip sort of that aspect of of figuring out, like they're so keen on figuring out why, why is it that you want to help someone else when the work sometimes is figuring out for yourself what it is you need to do to move forward with your own life, as opposed to thinking outside of yourself, thinking about what it is you need to do to empower so that you could be, you could best serve your clients or you know, or your employees or, or anyone else. Mm, yeah, my goodness. Now, you did mention that uh, you had overcome this in four months, which seems pretty amazing. Yeah, I want to go back and circle back to that. Not that we have to get really into the nitty gritty, but my goodness, that seems amazing. What do you, uh, we've talked about the mind, uh, the head, the heart and gut and things, but what are some things that you attribute to that kind of recovery. Yeah, I, I think it was my tenacious, um, like survival skills. I, I, I've always known that my, like, as much as I love the head and my brain, that it's always served me well. And I was researching in the hospital every single day. Now I was bedridden, so I didn't, I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> um, literally from Western to Eastern medicine to blogs, videos. Um, I was told I needed my first round of chemo. I did research on that. I really like went within and tried to figure out, is that the right answer for me? Um, I ended up choosing that as a path. Um, and I think a large part was that, I mean, as strange as it sounds, I only, I didn't want my extended family to come see me in the hospital. I didn't want to feel like I was a zoo animal. There was part of vulnerability that I wasn't in touch with. I really just focused on the head and focused on my inner drive to, to, you know, to beat this thing. Uh, and then I also attribute a lot of it to um, separating myself. I literally separated the Savio that was in the hospital bed who got this diagnosis to the Savio that's much more than that. The one that's, you know, you know, spiritually minded and soulful and emotion, caring and giving and I said, well, this one is on bed rest right now, but the other one can do things. And, you know, they call it in, in you know, in, 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 you know, you know, yoga circles as, you know, the chakras. And I basically tried to separate myself from, from the one who was ailing. Wow. That's, you know, what I'm taking as I'm listening to this is boundaries, not mm -hmm. only for, not only for others, you said I didn't want people to come visit me. I didn't want to feel like a zoo animal. Being able to set boundaries in a gentle, loving way, as I know you are, as to say, this is what it will best serve me best. And how many, t I can't tell you how many times with clients and people that I, come on the show, with some of the things I hear, it's like the hardest thing to do is to set boundaries because I don't want to hurt other people and other people are grieving or they're grieving more than I'm grieving which makes me grieve or anxious and what I was hearing here and even you set a boundary with yourself it's like okay I'm separating these two and I'm going to work on what I can work on and optimize 
what's ailing right now. Um, Absolutely. I, I find that interesting is boundaries are such a critical part that so many of us tend to downplay or I'll get to it. I'll get to setting boundaries tomorrow because I don't want to deal with any sort of backlash today. Yeah. I mean, I literally made fighting cancer my mission. I put everything else to the side. I literally, I mean, I was eating right before cancer. So I just continued. I was meditating. I've been a long, long, long time meditator for over 20 years. I was continuing on that. I was exercising through it. My hair was falling out. My eyebrows were falling out. No one tells you, Sharon, when you go through chemo <laughs> that everything, all your hairs fall out everywhere, if you know what I mean. And I felt like a, pu a prepubescent boy. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> really weird. Um, but I, yeah, I was exercising. I, um, I did some other you know, modalities. Um, and I said, as long as I do my part, there's nothing more I can do. No one tells you either when you start on immune, uh, after an autoimmune condition, they'll sometimes what they'd start you on are actually lighter versions of chemotherapy drugs instead of sometimes they're massive invasions like cancer, but other times they'll say you got to take this weekly or something like that, and that your hair falls out with that too. <laughs> so I can relate there because the interesting thing is people say you look so different. Well, you know, I used to have red hair, long and straight, and now it came back gray and absolutely curly. So <laughs> I, I joke because I used to pay for curls like this. Now I don't have to. It came back this way. And for me, like, you know, you, know, you can see me, but, you know, I, I literally like buzz my hair because I was like, now I'm going to wear it as a badge of courage. And it saved me so much time in the bathroom <laughs> that I love it. <laughs> Well, especially when you can't visit a, a hairdresser during the pandemic, <laughs> it works. But yeah, I think the one thing that was interesting for me is I, you and I do tend to share this a similar sense of humor where we're able to see some humor in the moment. And I found that other people found that distressing. I'm not sure about you, but I would make light of certain things that were happening out of my control to my body at the moment. And one of them was that with my diagnosis is my skin would rash rash up and then peel off as if I'd been sunburned. And in a, at the moment, it was very painful, very awful, very scary. I admit that. But as you come out the other side, you realize you got all this brand new skin. And I made a joke to the medical providers who were talking about the awful things. I said, hey, look, free laser peel. And you know, personally, I'm more, sort of, what did they call that? That morbid humor. But it was a nice way to reframe it. But what I found interesting was people were so offended that I would make light of what was going on for me. But that was the way I was able to adapt and, and make one of those boundaries for myself is, okay, I got to find some humor in this somewhere. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it you know, reminds me, in the two weeks that I was there, I literally had four roommates. Um, uh, and one of them I remember was so, so negative, like screaming and yelling at the nurses and doctors, like to let it literally like let him leave. He had to go through radiation like the next day. Um, and I said to him one night, I said, what do you need to get home for? It's like, it's, he's like my dog. And I'm like, but you're getting healing now. Like, I totally understand. And that I spoke to a friend about this. She's like, you don't get it. And I'm like, what? She goes, you have a different perception of like your cancer, they're thinking like they're at, you know, at the door right now and they're ready to go. And I'm like, oh, yes, I need to have more compassion for that. So for me, I couldn't understand it. I was like, well, you're here at the hospital to get healing. So like, just do what you need to do. But like you said, it, other people have a different, you know, viewpoint and perception. Yeah. And being able to understand that, what a nice gift they gave you when they <laughs> shifted that, um, your your perception of what other people are going through. I think that's important for us, and especially during the pandemic. A lot of things are happening now that they lifted the mask mandates and all this confusion because here where I live, it's not been lifted in an organized fashion. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I'm just finding that even here in what I'm saying, in a small microcosm of just lifting the mass mandates, we're finding a lot of lack of compassion going on for why someone uh, 
would make any choice they make in their world, whether vaccinated, unvaccinated, masked, unmasked, staying home, not staying home, whatever it is. I'm like, dude, you probably don't know the whole story. Yeah. And, and, and for me, I'm, I'm a huge advocate in someone having autonomy. I was able to have autonomy. I did what I needed to do, but I also did my integrative you know, modalities. And I, I'm an advocate for that. Uh, but I'm also someone who knows that sometimes the best course of action is not the action that everyone should be taking. And I hold that with, you know, you know, compassion and, and sacredness as well. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're down to the last four minutes. We could just go on and on. And I so appreciate you reaching out, Savio, to uh, be on the show, as well as just to make a nice connection between two wellness coaches. It uh, was really wonderful to get to know you even deeper during our interview here. I know you have a very fascinating website where you share secrets for living smarter and feeding the three brains, and it's called the human thehumanresolve.com. Remember to put the there, guys, thehumanresolve.com. Tell us a little bit about that. And you've got a, a great newsletter we can sign up for. I did, and I, I'm enjoying it. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So my newsletter, um, basically, I feed my three brains, uh, the head, heart, and, and, and gut. And through the practice, I basically expel and, and say, so they're all based upon prompts. So I have prompts beginning of every Monday. Uh, and I go into how I'm trying to figure out that prompt for myself. And I resource my three brains and I figure out what's one saying and how that moves within my body system. Uh, and I get very transparent and very honest about my past. And, and the whole point is really for others to glean that if I'm someone with all these issues and problems, that you could have empathy for me. And not only that, but you can have empathy for yourself and you could sort of figure out that mess, right? Those sticky parts in our nature that matter. I think a lot of people don't like to think of those sticky parts as beautiful, but I find it, like Margaret Mead, fascinating when I see them because I'm trying to make meaning out of it. I love that metaphor, Samuel, about Margaret Mead and the anthrop looking at myself from my life choices and where I'm at now from that anthropological point of view. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she would go, I mean, I only know a little bit about her because she was before my time, but she would literally go into some very remote places and just tell the story, not put her own spin on the story and take these beautiful images and, uh, you know, and, and you know, contextualize them in such a way that others found that human connection, you know, that we always think that we're so separate from one another. Uh, and, you know, like I, you know, I'm someone, like I said, who loves autonomy. So even like individuals that are sort of like anti-vaxxers, I'm trying to understand where that's coming from. And, you know, you could be on either side of the, the spectrum, but my whole thing is if you don't want to get vaxxed, then why are you judging people who want to get vaxxed? And to me, I'm always confused by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love this point of view and I, the quote that comes to mind, and I wish I could remember who said it, but something about a fish doesn't know they're in water. Yes. And when you're able to take yourself out of that water and just come to that point, and I do this a lot in my body language, nonverbal work of say that point of being the observer. It's not always easy because it's so easy to get sucked into some emotional uh, thread that's happening or some verbal thread that's happening. But just being in the observer and observe, possibly even observing you over there with that person in that situation and taking, as I said, taking myself out of the water into the observer position is really helpful sometimes to be able to go, oh, I get it now. I get why when I am near that person, I get activated or I feel anxious or whatever is going on. It's really helpful to be able to step into that third part, that third position of what I call the observer. Yeah. And what's, what's also fascinating about that third part is then you realize those triggers are not as harmful <laughs> as you thought they were, because you're just, like you said, observing and you're just witness, you're just a witness to that. Yeah. And sometimes you look at yourself and shake your head like, really? <laughs> Am I being dramatic or what over there? <laughs> totally, totally. Absolutely. 100% agree. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Savio, for being on the show. Everyone, that's Savio Clemente, and he has the website, The Human Resolve. He's a board-certified wellness coach and a podcaster and founder of The Human Resolve. So everyone, go over and get his newsletter. It's delightful. And join us next week for another brand new episode. Have a great week, whatever your adventures. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Do you want to be a better leader, have better relationships, become more self-aware, be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show, you know my passion, and maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift.